Hello, this is Tom Peterson. Uh, this is the second piece in our series on uh, how to publish a scientific paper. And essentially here in this, in this piece of this module, what I'd like to do is talk with you about essentially writing and conceiving the paper. Uh, what should its basic structure be? What are the order of, of the pieces and the order of, of your process of writing? Uh, but essentially, this is this is at the at the conception stage. So uh, we'll talk about a bunch of issues that are kind of basic design issues in your publication. A first and critical point is that of essentially scoping out your paper. And I'm just going to give you two um, possible configurations of a paper. We can go on the short and sweet. Uh, side, which is essentially a very compact paper that expresses uh, a single point, tests a single hypothesis, reports a single result, versus something that's that's longer and more complete, and maybe more of an, of an overview of a whole body of work. A lot of the papers that you'll develop as a scientist fall in between these two, but let's let's talk about them as if they were two options. At the short and sweet end, there's a, there are a lot of advantages. For one thing, it's a very easy paper to write because it's so simple. It's very linear. Uh, you have a simple message, and you pose a hypothesis, or you, you um, discuss what the question is, and you provide the answer. Obviously, in our scientific language, but it's, it's quite a simple and easy paper to write. And a third advantage is simply it's more publications on your on your curriculum. And at, at least at certain stages in careers, that's very important, where you are showing yourself to be a productive scientist. It's not without its disadvantages. Short and sweet papers, if you write too many of them about one subject, uh, can dilute the message. People will see one piece of the puzzle here and one pe piece of the puzzle there. And essentially, the reader ends up having to search for the whole story across a bunch of your publications. And that can really dilute the, the impact overall of, of your body of work. And, and certainly, the, the publication impact, maybe the citation rates per publication, get diluted because you're essentially putting the same message out there a bunch of times. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, we can write a very long paper that might present several hypotheses and, and uh, several insights. And the advantages are that you get the more of the whole story uh, out there in the scientific literature in one place. And obviously, a paper like that that, that deals with, with a broader uh, set of subject matter a paper like that has a greater p potential impact on the field and is going to see more and more citation. At the disadvantage side, well, certainly it can be more difficult to organize and write a paper like that because it has more complexity. It might have multiple types of methodologies, might have multiple uh, themes and hypotheses. The message can get quite complex. In fact, not on this list, but also it can be relatively difficult to get a journal to accept such a big piece of work. And again, on the more practical side, it's fewer publications that you can list on your CV because you may have packaged three or four publications into one. Okay, so just to give you an illustration of short and sweet versus long and complete, uh, here are two papers. I just chose them basically uh, at convenience out of the literature. But you can kind of get an idea of the contrast. Here we have co-occurrence of linguistic and biological diversity in biodiversity hotspots. Essentially, it's a single idea whether linguistic diversity and biological diversity are associated um, in these hotspots of biodiversity. At the other end of the spectrum, the paper that I wrote a few years ago, predicting the geography of species invasions via ecological niche modeling. That's not putting out a single question or a single uh, testable hypothesis. 
Rather, it's laying out a whole body of thinking. And so, again, this is a long paper. It's difficult to write. It's difficult to, to conceive and present effectively. But may, in the end, have more impact than something that tests a single question and may be uh, repeated over and over again, or may somebody may come back to this, this short and sweet paper with a different data set or a different tool. So I'm not saying that one or the other is better than the other. I'm saying that these are options that you need to think about as you think about your paper. Okay, so now the, the next question is, is picking a journal, which kind of goes hand in hand with uh, scoping your paper, with long and complete versus short and sweet. Um, picking a journal is not easy, and everybody um, misses on this question from time to time, and everybody ends up having to resubmit a paper to some other journal. But basically, you need to sit down with your advisors and your colleagues, and you need to contemplate, what's the ideal, optimal outlet for this paper? If you aim too high, if you go for science or nature or or a journal that's that's simply um, at a higher level than your paper is, well, you're going to waste your time because it's going to get rejected. Uh, you also waste time of the reviewers and of the editors. The whole process uh, is volunteer driven, and so if you are are shooting a couple levels too high for your paper you're basically just slowing down the whole process. At the other end of the spectrum, you can aim too low. You may have an important research result, and if you put it in some very minor regional journal, well, you get less credit, and your work gets less attention. So we don't want to mistake on either end of the spectrum. We need to consider characteristics of the journal. Look at what is the subject focus, read the, the statement of purpose of the journal, and don't think, well, they can, they can adjust and they may, like my, they may like my work anyway. If you don't fit within the focus of the journal, look for a different journal. Look at the table of contents and see what kinds of papers they're publishing. It may be a simple question like, are they publishing long and complete papers versus short and sweet papers? Or it may be, you know, are they publishing tropical papers, or are they, is it all very detailed experimental work in, in the temperate zone? Whatever the question is, are they looking? Is that journal interested in the sort of science you're doing? Now, you may also want to look at the impact factor. Basically, is this a journal that is at a high enough level that it, it gets your work out to the community uh, at a high enough level. And finally, I would urge you also to pay attention to the journal's policies about access. Uh, essentially, the question is, does the journal publish with an eye to making your work available to the whole scientific community? Or is it just a question of uh, making their publications available to those who are willing to pay for them and who are able to pay for them. We'll come back to this at the, at the end of this module when we talk about uh, open access considerations. So a last set of comments about this, this conceiving your paper stage uh, is essentially my experience with uh, at least one solution to how best to to uh, enter this process of writing your paper. This isn't the only way to do it. This is just something that works for me personally. I'll throw it out there, and I hope that you, over the course of your career, evolve your own solution. But this is something that, that I think works well. Uh, I would suggest that this order of writing, where first of all, you, you develop your figures and your tables, uh, these are essentially the unitary results of your paper. Uh, so these are, these are the, the, the pictures that tell the story that you're going to be relating in this paper. And directly from your figures and tables, you can go to your methods and your results. The methods have to tell in a very clear and concise way how you got 
from basic data, from input data, to the figures and tables that you're presenting in the paper. And the results should describe, one by one, those results. It may be a paragraph in the results for each figure. It may take a couple paragraphs. But basically, these figures and tables tell you how to structure the methods and the results. And so that's kind of the, the core of your paper. After that, I think is an appropriate time then to frame it. Now, of course, you've been thinking about this framing all along. But as you go through your results, as you prepare those figures and tables, as you write your methods, I think it, it leads you to think more deeply about uh, what it is you're expressing in this paper. So I think after you have the core done, it's the best time to write an introduction that poses the questions and write a discussion that, that considers their impact, uh, that discusses caveats and limitations, and that lays out uh, steps forward, essentially next steps along this path. Uh, and then finally, you've now written your whole paper. The abstract is, is your summary of the paper. So I think that's actually easiest to write at the end rather than at the beginning of the process, even though the abstract comes at the beginning of the paper. Now, a couple other points. At the end of this introduction, your last paragraph really needs to state very clearly why this paper needs to be published. What is the, the, the contribution of this paper to the broader literature? And so I personally feel like the last paragraph of the introduction should begin. This paper does the following. And I think that is an effective way of leading into um, the rest of your paper. Your introduction gives the rationale of why the reader should care. And that last paragraph lays out exactly what it is that this paper is going to do, given that rationale. I see a common tendency for people to go on at great length in the introduction and discussion of these papers. Uh, an introduction may only be three paragraphs. That may be enough to set up the question, particularly when we're talking about short and sweet papers. The discussion, perhaps a bit longer, but it needs to give the panoramic view of the results of the paper. It needs to discuss the limitations of the paper, and it needs to, to discuss its implications towards future work. What are the next steps afterwards? And then a very um, specific pet peeve of mine is, you don't need to repeat. Uh, there's no need to repeat parts of the introduction and the discussion, or parts of the results in the discussion. I think oftentimes a conclusion section is an excuse to repeat stuff that you've already said in the results in the discussion. So contemplate whether you really need to say things twice. The words are there once, and that's plenty for an attentive reader to, to capture. So that's a set of thinking about essentially the basic design and concept of your paper. And now we're going to go on and talk about uh, more, more specifics in the, the coming parts of this module.